Thanks for joining this episode of Crops TV. My name's Megan Anderson, and I'm an extension field agronomist in central Iowa with Iowa State University. This episode will discuss the return of last year's herbicide, and it will be a review of some of the carryover issues we've had recently and in the past, and what we may see looking forward. Our discussion today will revolve around a few simple topics. First, we'll discuss some basics of herbicide carryover, We'll visit about a few chemistries that have a tendency to be more persistent when we apply them in the soil, Uh, and we'll discuss some management considerations uh, that we may think about when it comes to reducing our risk for herbicide carryover. So what is herbicide carryover? Herbicide carryover is crop injury associated with a herbicide that was applied the prior growing season. And there are a number of factors that can influence our risk of any particular soil applied herbicide carrying over. In particular, uh, herbicide product is a huge uh, influencer of whether or not we may see issues in future years, as well as the rate in which that herbicide was applied, the characteristics of the soil that we applied the herbicide on, uh, the environmental conditions, particularly rainfall after the time of application, and then, of course, the susceptibility of whatever rotational crop we are going to put in that field to the herbicides that were applied the prior growing season. Herbicide carryover can often appear erratic in fields. Uh, It seems like it's most often related with uh, high application rates in particular areas that maybe overlap uh, or certain soil types and fields. When we apply a soil applied herbicide or a residual herbicide to the soil in a crop field, it enters the soil complex. And once it's in that complex, uh, there are a number of fates that it can meet. Uh, So like this graphic shows, uh, there are three primary things that can happen to it. The first of which is that it can be adsorbed to soil minerals and organic matter. When that happens, uh, it will be less available for breakdown. It's not going to be present in the soil water, uh, and there's very little loss that will occur from that. Uh, It can also be available in the soil water, uh, especially if there's sufficient moisture in the field. And so we often think of herbicides as needing uh, some amount of moisture to basically rain in that herbicide and get it incorporated into the soil. And if it's available in that soil water, it would be available for plant uptake, as well as things like leaching. Uh, Finally, the third uh, fate that the herbicide can meet uh, once it's in that soil complex uh, is that it can be lost via air uh, with volatilization. Uh, This typically would account for a very small amount of herbicide and certain products would be more prone to this than others. So some of the things that will primarily influence uh, the persistence of a herbicide in a field would be things like soil type and soil organic matter, Uh, typically higher clay content soils and soils with more organic matter will have more herbicide binding sites, which could in some cases with certain chemistries lead to increased persistence. Soil pH would be another factor. Uh, This is a big kind of Goldilocks situation where we would prefer things not be too high or too low. Uh, Some chemistries are going to be more persistent uh, or perhaps more available at low uh, pHs versus other products being more persistent or more available at high pHs. The environment within the soil Uh, beyond just the soil types of soil organic matter and soil pH uh, is hugely important. So rainfall and temperature would be big driving factors on our breakdown processes. So for rainfall, we would consider both the amount of rainfall that we are getting after our herbicide application, as well as the timing of that, because uh, rainfall shortly after application is probably more likely to jumpstart the breakdown process of herbicides rather than rainfall that comes long after that application occurred. Uh, as well as the temperature, right? We want ample uh, warmth in the soil, uh, but of course we don't want it to be too hot because microbial processes are extremely important for many of our herbicides as far as breakdown goes. And so if we get too hot, we could slow those microbial breakdown processes. It's also important to remember that interactions between all of these different factors can be extremely complex. So for example, we could have a soil that would be sandy, in which case it's not going to have very many binding sites for a particular herbicide. Uh, So that could lead to increased persistence. However, sandier soils are going to dry out faster 
then maybe soils that have more clay content in them or higher organic matter, in which case that may slow microbial breakdown processes. So we may end up having a persistence issue in those lighter soils, uh, even though it wouldn't be intuitive to think that. We do want soil applied herbicides to last for some time or persist after herbicide application because we need that residual activity in order to control some of our most challenging weed issues. Uh, so this graphic created by Bob Hartzler just is a, a very simple depiction of what happens to a residual herbicide after application. So you could see at the time of application, you would start with essentially 100% of that herbicide, we hope. Uh, and in an average rainfall environment, that breakdown happens and, and perhaps a year later or even uh, sooner than that, there would be very little chemistry left uh, to cause any issues with rotational crops. Uh, however, if we're in a dry environment, those breakdown processes of the herbicide will slow uh, and we're going to have increased herbicide persistence. And this is uh, one of the big reasons that it seems like in recent years we have run into more issues uh, with herbicide persistence um, compared with maybe prior growing seasons. So you can see here this December 15th drought map. I've pulled together essentially uh, the whole Midwest and even some Western states together here uh, to show how dry we are uh, at this time. And it's very unlikely that this map will do much changing until the soils thaw next spring. Uh, so basically looking toward 2023, it's highly likely that in some of these areas, particularly areas that have been suffering from drought conditions since the growing season or the time of herbicide application, uh, that we could see issues next year uh, with herbicide carryover. Here's another map that you might look at to better understand the soil moisture conditions that we're facing here in basically the Midwestern United States. And so as you can see on this map, it's looking from the zero to 100 centimeters uh, soil depth uh, and basically giving you an idea of how much moisture is available in that soil. And so you can see that throughout uh, north central Iowa, uh, the Eastern Corn Belt, as well as other parts of the Western Corn Belt, uh, we have extremely low soil moistures in that zero to 100 centimeter depth. Uh, so we are suffering some from some uh, pretty serious moisture deficits. However, they also have mapping available for the 20 centimeter soil moisture profile. Uh, and essentially showing here that you could see that even though we are quite dry in some areas, particularly Western Iowa and through the Western Corn Belt, uh, we are sitting closer to normal anyway for much of our uh, central U.S. and eastern Corn Belt. So you can see that we're sitting uh, much closer to what would probably be normal with more moisture in that soil profile, at least closer to the soil surface. This is important because as we think of where our herbicide is primarily going to be located in the soil, it's going to be close to the surface of the soil um, unless it's been leached down out of the depth of our root zone, basically. Uh, and so this is showing that perhaps in some of these areas, we aren't going to have as much potential anyway uh, for herbicide issues as we are in other areas like the western part of Iowa and through the western part of the Corn Belt. So how do herbicides degrade? There are three primary processes um, that assist in herbicide degradation. The by far the most common one is going to be microbial decomposition. Uh, so that's where things like fungi, bacteria, uh, and other things within the soil uh, essentially are using our herbicides as food uh, and breaking them down to byproducts that basically have no herbicide activity in them. Um, chemical decomposition is another type of decomposition uh, that occurs basically by chemical processes in the soil, so it's not going to be assisted by any microbes or other living organisms. And then photo decomposition would be the third type. This is pretty uncommon uh, for most of the products we apply, uh, but it would be where sunlight is basically breaking down that herbicide and is something that can be an issue with certain products, in particular like trifluralin or what would commonly be known as treflan. And so if a product does have a photo decomposition issue where the sunlight may break it down if it's left on the soil surface, they will often be indicated on the label by the suggestion that you need to incorporate it within a certain period after application. 
these decomposition processes are going to be affected somewhat by right, moistures and temperature. In particular, the microbes are going to be highly affected by what those conditions are in the soil at and after the time of application. Chemical decomposition is not going to be as affected by moisture and uh, soil conditions, uh, and photo decomposition will not as well, but especially microbial decomp, that's very important. So let's move on and talk about some of the chemistries that we know are more persistent, uh, especially in our corn and soybean production systems. Our first one is going to be atrazine. Uh, atrazine is a member of the herbicide group five or photosystem two inhibitors. Uh, and it has been known for a very long time that it's prone to uh, carrying over and causing issues in high pH soils, especially. Uh, so that's a huge concern. We need to be aware of where our high pH soils are, and we can adjust our atrazine rate or perhaps consider other products uh, if we know that atrazine will be an issue. With a number of our products, we are going to be using basically products from the same herbicide group year after year, right? So if we use atrazine in corn, uh, we may choose to use metribuzin in soybean. Uh, but if we are concerned about carryover from atrazine in corn, uh, using metribuzin in soybean can actually increase that risk. And so uh, that may be something to consider uh, this coming growing season if you are concerned about carryover from atrazine in particular. This risk of uh, herbicide carryover in atrazine has been well known and well documented for a very long time. But what's also interesting is that in more recent years, uh, there's been some really good research that has come out and shown that we have enhanced microbial degradation happening in some of these soils where we have used atrazine year after year or maybe every other year for, for decades, basically. And so the risk of atrazine carryover in fields with a long history of atrazine use is likely much lower uh, than it has been in the past. The symptoms of atrazine carryover, if you were to notice it in your crop field, you're highly likely to notice uh, symptoms like I've noted in this picture on the, on the slide. So chlorosis or yellowing in between the leaf veins followed by this uh, dramatic necrosis or death between those leaf veins where they stay green, uh, but the tissue between them dies. Um, this is common on the unifoliate leaves and can also be carried into the first trifoliate leaves, uh, but the new leaves that develop after that are typically unaffected. ALS inhibitors are members of the group two herbicides, uh, especially products we use in soybean like chlorimuron, chlorancillum, and imazethapyr are quite common uh, to cause carryover issues. And again, we are using group two products very commonly in corn in addition to in soybean, and that can increase our risk. In particular, Chlorimuron is one that's likely to carry over in high pH soils and cause injury to corn the following year. And so again, these high pH soils, uh, that may be a consideration in your applications. Definitely important to pay attention to things like your herbicide rate and the timing of application. The symptoms of ALS inhibiting herbicides and the injury that they cause on corn uh, can be somewhat nondescript, but the key is looking underneath the soil surface uh, for bottle brush roots, which are so nicely shown in this image. Uh, so basically those bottle br brush roots are going to often be uh, thicker. They'll be very um, straight out from the roots. And this is the key to identifying this type of herbicide injury. Above ground, we may see things like stunted plants. We might see chlorosis or maybe even purpling of the plants, but it's pretty nondescript. Uh, and it often occurs in areas where we might expect some corn to be undergoing stress anyway. So just to exemplify that, here's a few pictures of what I might expect from ALS inhibitor carryover. So uh, you can see on the left, we see purple mid veins. Maybe that corn is, is kind of a, a lighter green color, but it's got a lot of other purple color. So that just tells me the roots uh, are probably not growing the way that they should. And, and that would be a case in which I would dig it up to check. And again, same with that center picture. The interesting thing about that center picture is you can see that the soil uh, has a lot of sandier material at the surface. So it may be carrying over and causing that injury uh, because it was a high rate for that uh, lighter soil type. And then on the far right side, you can see that um, 
there was likely a rate control issue that occurred where perhaps right at that field entrance, uh, that sprayer sprayed out a higher rate of product than uh, we wanted to see. And you can see there's um, perhaps missing plants as well as stunting that happened. Clopyrrolid, uh, one of our herbicide group four products that can be found in things like Hornet, Resicor, SureStart, et cetera, uh, can be a carryover issue in particularly in uh, kind of our lighter soil types, uh, so sandier or more gravelly soils. Uh, and this crop injury can often be associated with application uniformity. Uh, the symptoms that you might notice on plants uh, are typically quite distinct as growth regulator symptoms are. Uh, so we would notice stunting of plants, we would notice cupping of leaves, uh, malformation of those leaf veins, and in fact, we might actually see that uh, high rates of clopyrrolid carryover could kill the apical meristem on those plants or the apical bud. And we would see a kind of a proliferation as shown in this picture on this slide of a lot of new leaves trying to get uh, pushed out by some of our axillary meristems. Uh, this type of injury is not not often going to be nearly as uniform as something like drift would be. Again, it will be related with application uniformity issues uh, or perhaps variability within the soil itself. We do have growth regulator carryover from other products within this group. In, partic in particular, things we might use in uh, hay or pasture that could be carried through in hay bales that we apply to fields. It could be carried through um, even in manure, uh, or if we rotate out of hay or pasture and plant something like soybeans, we can see injury. Uh, the two primary products that I think of as causing these types of issues are things like picloram and aminopyrrolid, uh, but we can see it from clopyrrolid as well. It's just perhaps not as commonly used. Uh, you can see in the picture on the left, uh, they actually rolled out hay bales uh, that were um, laid out in corn stalks, right? And the, the cattle fed on them. And of course, the following year, we noticed then significant injury in the soybeans where those hay bales were rolled out because uh, they harvested that hay after an application of one of these herbicides. And you can see on the right, they actually rotated that field out of pasture uh, where they had applied one of these products. And you can see the very patchy injury um, that we wouldn't expect to see from a drift case, a uh, very severe injury in both of these fields uh, from carryover of these products. So it's extremely important if you are applying these products to pasture in particular or fields that could be hayed at some point in the future that we pay very close attention to the label restrictions. Fomesifen is a member of our uh, herbicide group 14. Uh, Flexstar is probably the most commonly known product uh, that we use in our soybeans. And so this is maybe our poster child for herbicide carryover issues because of the late applications uh, that are associated with this herbicide. So in the past, it hasn't been unusual for these herbicide applications to be uh, occurring in late June or even perhaps early July. Um, and of course, the later that application occurs with that 10 month rotation interval to corn on these labels, uh, the riskier it's going to be coming in with corn the following year, especially if we have dry conditions after application. Uh, the other issue that we run into with these is uneven herbicide applications, in particular when these uh, fomesifen products are mixed with certain formulations of glyphosate. Uh, so we can have mixing issues that can result in uneven rates being uh, applied across the field because of the inc incompatibility uh, that you may not notice in the soybean, but you will certainly notice the following year in the corn. And I've got some images of, of that to show. Uh, the symptoms that we might see on the corn plants are extremely distinct. So as this image shows, what we are looking for is necrotic veins on the leaves. Uh, so you could see here that it's not interveinal chlorosis or necrosis dying between the veins. This is actually the vein itself uh, turning uh, yellow and then brown and then dying. Um, the midrib as well can suffer from this and it can become so weak that those plants look very floppy uh, and it can kind of break over midway across the leaf. And I'll show you this, this picture on the left you can kind of see that wilty appearance when those uh, midribs become weak 
uh, and kind of bend over that those plants look uh, very weak. This compatibility issue is a problem. Of course, we're not using as much fomesophen now as we have maybe five years ago, uh, but it could be making a comeback. And it's important to remember the compatibility problems that can occur when we mix with other herbicides. Uh, so you can see here that you can actually picture the route that the sprayer took through the field the prior year. And now we have dead corn uh, and injured corn as a result of that application. HPPD inhibitors or group 27 herbicides, especially products used post-emergence like mesotrione or tapramazone, right? That would be Callisto or things like Impact or Armazon. Uh, low pH soils can increase the persistence of these products. Uh, so that's one consideration because we can increase our persistence with low pH soils. And then when we lime those soils, we can actually make them more available in the soil. And so oftentimes when people notice uh, the injury, it's after a dry year, and it can actually be in those higher pH areas of the field because of that availability. It's often going to be patchy injury, again, related to application variability. Overlap is uh, often easier to pick up, as well as soil variability because of the, the way these show up in the field. The symptoms are quite distinct though. Uh, chlorosis or bleaching of the new leaves as shown in this picture uh, is the most common symptom. We can see it along the leaf edges like in the bottom part of the picture, uh, or we can see the case like in the upper part of the picture where we have completely turned those leaves white. Occasionally, we can see leaf malformation that uh, looks like it kind of mimics a group 4 herbicide like 2,4-D, uh, but we will see chlorosis paired with that. So you can see in this picture on the left, that's just an example of the chlorosis along with that leaf distortion where those veins can kind of lengthen out. Um, what we can also see is we see a lot of HPPD inhibitors applied with other products. So it can be difficult to parse out which herbicide did what, uh, but that investigation is important to try and figure out what it is that's truly causing the issue. Is it just the HPPD inhibitor or was it more than one thing? And you can see how uh, important those soil conditions can be to influencing the potential for carryover like in this field. So now that we've gone through some of the herbicides that are more likely to be persistent, let's talk about the management considerations that we might take to reduce our risk of herbicide carryover. Right, first of all, we wanna make sure that we are following the label. And the first important thing for following the label is making sure that we're following whatever the rotational restrictions are for that herbicide application and the timing to plant the following crop. So you can see this Herbicide obviously is approved for application in corn because you can replant or rotate corn at any time after the application, uh, but you have to look down the list to soybeans, right? If you want to plant that the following growing season, you would need to wait 10 months. So the clock starts on the date of your application and it would be 10 months from then when you would be allowed to plant soybeans as a rotational crop. So again, with following the label, one of the other important things is making sure that we are choosing appropriate products for the soils that we have in our fields, as well as appropriate rates of individual herbicides based on the soil types in the field. So considerations that you might take into account would be the percent organic matter, uh, perhaps the soil texture, and then definitely the pH for certain products. So like in this picture, you can see that we are on a heavy dark soil at the bottom of the field uh, and there is no injury to those soybean plants and plenty of water hemp the following spring. And if you look in the background, you may be able to notice that those plants as you get further away and you start to move up a slight slope, they actually are exhibiting herbicide injury and there's fewer weeds there because of carryover from the prior year. Uh, so whatever, whatever the rate was, it was certainly appropriate for the higher organic matter, darker soil. Uh, but we needed to make those considerations for the entirety of the field and not just one soil type. We want to make sure to make timely herbicide applications. And so later herbicide applications, uh, shortening that interval between when you're going to uh, apply the herbicide and plant the following rotational crop is going to naturally increase your risk. Uh, so like in this picture of this fomesophen carryover issue, 
there were probably several issues going on in this field, right? We likely had a late herbicide application where this product was perhaps used as kind of a rescue. Um, it looks like compatibility was likely an issue in the field. Uh, and perhaps the rate was even increased in general uh, because it was perhaps being used as kind of a rescue type application. So it's important to take all these things into consideration and just make sure that we are being timely with our herbicide applications and not risking um, later season applications, which could be uh, less prone to breaking down due to the hotter temperatures uh, and less soil moisture perhaps available for that breakdown process. Uh, and just make sure that we're gonna be safe going into the fall and growing season. We wanna make sure uh, that we are being careful when we both mix and apply our herbicide products. So of course, making sure that we follow the label to make sure that we are mixing in the appropriate order, that we're using appropriate rates, and that we're not going to be running into any compatibility issues or carryover issues due to misunderstanding what the label is asking of us. Additionally, if you are making mixes, especially ones you haven't done before, uh, Right, we're in this time of supply chain problems, perhaps using different products than we're used to using, making sure that we do those jar tests so that we do not end up with a field-wide mistake either this year or in a carryover situation uh, is hugely important. Uh, so this image on the left actually shows, uh, perhaps you can see the stripes through the field uh, where the prior year they had a dripping nozzle uh, across the entire field applying a higher rate of a fomesifen product. And they could see it the next year in the corn where it killed any corn w w that was growing right in that stripe. Uh, and then on the right hand side, this again was one of these compatibility problems uh, where they ended up with a lot of dead corn the following year because of the problems in the application in soybean. Making sure to minimize stress on rotational crops, right? This is outside of the herbicide label, but this is a hugely important consideration, especially as we look forward uh, from perhaps prior years where herbicide carryover is a risk or a potential problem, but there's nothing we can do to help that now at this point. So making sure that when we go out to plant the following spring after a potential year where herbicide carryover could be a problem, we're doing everything we can to minimize the amount of stress that those crops are undergoing, right? Making sure to plant in a timely manner when soil conditions are appropriate, uh, making sure to do things like in this field, perhaps managing residue would have reduced the amount of in injury that these plants were uh, suffering from, uh, for example. So Right, we want 50 degree and warming soil temperatures. We want the appropriate amount of soil moisture so that we are not compacting the soil when we plant and certainly taking care to uh, make sure that we don't have uneven residue distribution uh, or issues associated with that through the field as well. So looking forward to 2023, some of us here in Iowa and beyond could potentially be facing a herbicide carryover issue. So. What do we do right now? I think, first of all, we can check our herbicide labels from 2022 uh, for things like the rotational restrictions, uh, paying attention to what those are and making sure to obey them now that we're going to go in and plant in 2023. Uh, also keeping an eye out for other warnings that were on labels, perhaps related to soil pH uh, or certain, er, certain types of soil where it may be more likely to persist. Uh, minimizing the stress again on that 2023 crop is going to be important to end up with a nice stand like this cornfield has here and reduce the risk of herbicide carryover, uh, causing some additional stress along with the other things that could be going on like soil moisture, temperature, etc. cetera. Uh, one tip that I would have is to consider what your herbicides were last year when you're making plans for this year. Uh, so perhaps if you applied atrazine in 2022, and maybe it was a little bit of a later application because we know planting was later in 2022, perhaps you would want to avoid using metribuzin this year in your soybean herbicide program, or at least considering things like rate application timing and the sensitivity of your soybeans to things like metribuzin uh, when you're making this year's plans. 
Finally, after we go out and plant, right, we've made our herbicide applications in the spring of 2023, make sure to go out and scout those fields so that you are actually checking to see whether herbicide carryover was an issue. That's going to be the best way for you to alter your plans for future years and be best informed as to what your risk in your own fields may be. In summary, we know that dry weather increases the risk of herbicide persistence and that much of Iowa and other parts of the Midwest have suffered from dry weather um, for some time, uh, but especially during the summer of 2022 and now moving into 2023. We are certainly drier than we would like to be uh, facing next growing season. That all could change, but I think the risk is still there from a herbicide persistence perspective if we were dry last summer. Make sure to consider the products that you're using, the timing of those applications, the rate of those herbicides, and what type of soil they were applied to to evaluate your risk. Certainly some herbicides are going to cause more issues in certain soil types or pHs. Despite more carryover noticed in recent years, I think overall our risk remains fairly low. Uh, especially if we're making sure to follow those labels and making appropriate applications for the soil type, reducing things like overlap or incidental high rates. Um, so this likely doesn't result in a big need to change any cropping plans. Uh, I don't think we're in a dire scenario with herbicide carryover, but I do think hopefully today you've learned some things uh, that can help us better manage this risk in the future and perhaps reduce the likelihood even more so uh, that we might see this in the future. Mm -hmm.